So I'm J.C. Vega. I'm a, uh, not a diversity and inclusion person. I'm an operator. I'm a former CISO and been doing operations, but I've experienced some of the challenges and work in this space as a champion. To my left, Larry. Uh, Larry Whiteside, Jr. I am a CISO. I'm a career CISO, uh, but I'm also the co-founder and current president of an organization called Cybersity that is geared at increasing diversity in cybersecurity. Nicole Gilmore, Director of Talent Development at the MITRE Corporation, and I've been working in acquisition and talent development, building talent for the future. Uh, Dr. Heiss Gibson, I'm a professor at the Harvard Business School, uh, teach operations at HBS, and also developed an inclusion course at the Harvard Business School. So uh, very passionate about this work and appreciate Carlos, longtime friend, for inviting me to be part of the conversation. Well, with that, let's get started. First of all, we say that diversity, equity, and inclusion training is failing. What do we mean by that? So let's just, by a show of hands, by the way, this is an interactive session. It's 8 in the, 8.30 in the morning. we got to get going here. <laughs> Who has been through DEI training? Raise your hand. Who has said it has changed their world? <laughs> Who has said, you taught me something new that I, all, that I never knew, and thank you for sharing this. Okay, a couple of hands here. Who was really on the fence? when you went into that training? And I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands on this one. Who was a naysayer going in? It only validated the bias that you had or activated the bias that you had. That's one of the challenges with how we're doing diversity and equity and inclusion uh, programs now. They're meant to protect the organization from litigation. There's mainly three aspects to it and we're not gonna cover those because you're living those. I'm just gonna introduce them. One of them is diversity and equity uh, training. The other is recruiting and performance tests, quotas, and things where there's testing people for ability that have cultural bias. And if you look at some of those tests, again, this isn't about those tests, you'll find that your background really does matter. And SAT tests have been changed because of the bias that is in some of those things that unless you experience it, there's no way that uh, certain groups are ever gonna score high on those standardized tests. But there's also a third part to the current practice and that's a grievance system. The grievance system is designed so that if somebody does have an issue, they have a method, a legal method to challenge the system and get recourse for that. Now, is that working? The challenge with the grievance system is the EEOC rates retaliation to grievance as their number one uh, complaint that they have, usually coupled with a diversity issue. So what you're finding is that there's subtle and overt retaliation if you report. Now, usually we've practiced this here a couple of different times uh, with different audiences. All the time we hear someone, oh my gosh, that happened to me, that happened to me. And the idea, the idea that you can talk about it among this group, but you can't talk about it among the whole, every group. That's some of the challenges we have. We're not increasing the numbers. In fact, we show that when you recruit a specific demographic, if you don't do the follow-on things that we're going to talk about, you actually have a greater attrition rate of that specific demographic that you just hired. Now, here's the challenge. I used to say there's three type of audience members here. Those that I'm preaching to the choir, I don't need to tell you anything about this. You're already on board. I mentioned that group that's in the middle that we say, okay, you know, I, I'm willing to do this, but it's not very effective if the culture of the organization does not support with the training or the quality of the instruction. So there's a holistic approach there. And then those who aren't gonna believe no matter what, and you're just giving them more fuel for their specific bias. 
But then, after speaking to several senior executives, I discovered there's a fourth group. And I wouldn't say they're the most dangerous group, but they're the ones that can hurt the program the most. That fourth group is the ones who do believe, but they're being given standards or metrics that they have to exceed or meet that are unattainable. So while they were champions to begin with, and they did everything they could to increase, but they didn't get the right demographics in, in their organization, and they end up getting a less than successful evaluation on that part. Now, they were on board, and you just flipped them. And these are the, mo the biggest influencers in your organization. So we can't continue doing what we're doing. We have to change our perspective on how we deal with this challenge that affects all of us and we already know there's a talent shortage in our field. We need more talent. We need to reach in other buckets. We need to reach in other communities. We need to do something different because we can't expect the same result from our past practice. So we got together, we brainstormed some ideas, we shot them across a, a large uh, population of senior executives, and we picked six things that we think can make an impact. Now among us here, we, uh, we have lots of military experience. And the military doesn't make you a superhero. I'll be the first one to tell you that. We're normal. But there's something about that experience with training and developing people that we can apply to this field here. So you might see some references to that. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So one of the things that you first have to do is you have to engage the community as a leader. So there's a little bit more to it than that. There's this concept of engagement. And it's different than another aspect you're going to hear about contact. So let's start with engagement. Nicole, let's start with you. When we say you have to engage to have an effective DEI program, yeah. what, what do you mean by that? So I'm glad you asked because we started out on engagement, the idea of engagement with a business imperative and that business imperative was that we needed more people we needed more skilled talent and we weren't buying them or we weren't acquiring them fast enough so we started with a business imperative that led to very focused strategic activity so we developed a strategy that engaged the community in very specific ways we went out and learned about our market to try to understand where we could find talent. And then we looked internally at our own population of employees to understand how we could build the talent internally. And then we started working with coalitions and academic partners and specific individual organizations more effectively. So our engagement came from lessons learned but it was driven by a strategic business imperative to acquire more talent. We just weren't finding enough of them. You know, that's interesting because you all know who is best at engagement marketing. They know where to, where to find that new market to generate revenue, and that's something about the engagement. And you mentioned uh, reaching out to different partners to find champions. Absolutely. We, so Absolutely. people were going to stand in front and promote that. Yes. Coalitions, uh, effective coalitions, strategic public-private partnerships is where we found a sweet spot as part of our competitive advantage in our organization. And we looked to partners who had a similar shared belief about how we find talent, how we go into um, underrepresented populations, how we tap untapped resources more specifically and more effectively. And then it was about understanding how to build the relationship and then valuing that building relationships takes time. It's not a one and done. After we did the first splash in a community, we knew we had to come back and we had to invest in building relationships in order to strengthen those partnerships. That takes a pretty healthy appetite sure. for engagement. And sometimes the business imperative or the business goal is short term. We knew that we had to be in these relationships for the long haul, and that sustained the momentum
from the initial DNI pushes. Uh, that, that's fantastic, and, and I don't want to lose sight. You're coming from the business side, as with MITRE and some of the other your past experience. You you worked in the business schools and several universities. One of the things that I we have to stress is DEI is an ineffective program if there's no revenue for the organization. So it's a business operation necessity. You have to communicate some of that aspect of it. So what's the impact of engagement? Heis, do you, do you mind? I appreciate it, and I think the impact of engagement is, uh, think of engagement more as a strategic initiative. So we have uh, an engagement strategy, and you have to gain buy-in from all the individuals inside the organizations at Echelon at multiple levels in order for people to go out and do. So if we think about the organizations we've been in, I'm sure there's many different values, many different ways in which we describe and discuss how we feel we're going to do X or Y, but we really don't know how to do it. And that's where the, the contact comes in, into play. Engagement is that overarching vision, that overarching strategy, but without the communicating how to do the thing we want to do, meaning how do we actually leverage the contact part of this, it doesn't happen. So we have to engage uh, in a repetitive way in order to support the engagement vision that we say we want to have. I like that because we're focused on DEI and talent management, but there's also people of color also buy things. They're also your customers. So there's more to it than that from a business perspective. If you do well in some of these aspects, the company does well also. But you mentioned something specific there, and I want to kind of pull that thread a little bit. There's engagement, and then you mentioned contact. They're not synonymous, not in this context. Larry, you want to expand on that? Yeah, so, so it's interesting. As we got into this dialogue, one of those things was, What's the difference between engagement and contact? <clears throat> so when we think engagement, it's about the reaching out. It's about, it's about having that dialogue about the problem you're trying to solve and trying to get it. But what we don't realize is internally, once we get these people that we're looking to fill these roles in these diverse communities in our organizations, if we aren't contacting them and reaching out and touching them internally, they're going to leave. Right? They're going to leave the organization. So it's important that everybody recognizes that once you get this diverse talent into your organization, you have to stay in contact with them. You have to create contact points for you to engage internally with them and make them feel like they are part of the solution. Right now, women of color are the number one demographic leaving the industry of cybersecurity faster than any other demographic. And it's because organizations have not found ways to create internal mechanisms of contact, safe spaces for them to speak, making them feel like they have a voice inside their organization to be part of the solution. So this, <clears throat> this aspect of contact is about reaching inward, reaching down and touching them, engaging with them internally, giving them safe space, giving people the feeling that they too are part of the larger solution. Think of it this way. If you're sitting in a room and you are the only person that looks like you, has your background, how do you feel or be made to feel like you have a voice? So organizations have to be very purposeful in their operations of how they reach in, contact, communicate, and work with these people internally to make sure that they are getting their voice heard and feel like they are being part of the solution. You know, and you mentioned a, a term that kind of a hot button issue on, on some, and that's safe space. It's not necessarily what everybody thinks it is, at least not the way I interpret it. It's not asking permission or being allowed to speak. It's being comfortable with the organization where you're expected to contribute. You're expected that you are going to share your thoughts on the matter where you don't need permission from somebody else to do it. And so it's feeling safe, feeling confident, feeling empowered to do that. But that's a great distinction between the engagement, which is the, the big strategy, and the actual doing it at the, 
employee level, and I equate that to being invited to a party, being invited to the dance, and actually being invited on the dance floor. So you're being included when you're actually being a part of the activity that's going on, an important part of it. And I know a few of us have been on the, dance, on, on the wall sometimes <laughs> waiting to be asked to dance. Regardless, it's an uncomfortable feeling, but that's just to give you the visual. But with that, um, Nicole, what's the impact to business? What's the impact to the operation, to security? I think it's stronger teams. I think it's stronger leadership. I think it's teams that are activated to drive toward the mission, toward the target. When a leader sets the conditions for all of the voices in the room to be heard, and then the people at the table feel empowered to actually speak, to say their part, to contribute what they have, then it provides this collaboration within the team. What happens currently is people are afraid. Leaders are afraid to set the conditions. Team members are afraid to talk amongst themselves before the leader gets in the room. And then when the team project or team effort activates, it's stale or it's stalled. And then there is finger pointing. Whose fault is it that the conversation didn't get started? Whose fault is it that we didn't play fairly or that we didn't play well together to actually innovate? It's our collective fault. It's our collective responsibility. And I think the specific impact is that if we don't do it, we stall innovation. And then we don't achieve business outcomes. And that's great, because a lot of that is diversity of thought. It comes with that background. And a lot of that, I don't think the same as you. I see the problem different. That's where most of these companies that are here, the problem was there long before they invented something or they created something or discovered something. That innovation came from someone saying, you know what, I think about this problem and solution differently. And so that, that's powerful there. But you mentioned something about the collective. The collective's a big deal. How many of you have a mentor? How many of you are a mentor? How many of you have a coach? How many of you have been a coach? You've been advisors. You've been people that, uh, individual that people lean on because of your experience. We do that because we believe in the collective, that we're going to share our knowledge, share our experience. But I challenge you that that is not enough. There is a next level to that. Heis, take it away. Thanks. So, <laughs> <laughs> so because all, so many of you raised your hand and highlighted that you were either a mentee or mentor to someone, and that is amazing. And if we're honest, when we think about who we mentor, a mentor is like a coach that guides us through a journey. You can lean on and ask questions, get perspective. But there's a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. So if you really think about who are you sponsoring, because when you sponsor someone, you have skin in the game. You are being someone's advocate when they are not in the room. And a sponsor does not have to be your mentor. A mentor might not be the spo your sponsor. And if you think about opportunities that exist, a sponsor creates opportunity, whereas a mentor helps prepare you for said opportunity. And if we're honest about how we are as people, we're kind of a herd mentality as individuals. Meaning, right or wrong, who do you mentor? You're gonna probably mentor someone who is similar to you. So I might find, you know, let's see, you know, Larry has hair. So I, can't, <laughs> I, can't, I can't look at Larry and say, you know what, Larry, you know, we can do this because you know, he doesn't shave his head. So, <laughs> might not be the right guy. So, you know, so we find people like ourselves that we want to mentor. But if we really take stock at who has the capabilities, when we are, have the opportunity to be in the room, are you being someone's advocate who is not like you? And you need to have that difference and then recognize who are you mentoring, who's mentoring you, and who is actually your sponsor? Because it is very important as we think about the engagement, the contact, if the individuals at certain levels aren't being uh, deliberate about who they engage with, 
and who they speak up for, the, uh, the opportunity to create a value-driven organization that drives revenue is challenged. So w with that, show of hands, in the, one of the last jobs that you received, how many of you had a sponsor? Someone advocated for you. You probably had a lot of mentors. Who made an impact on you? That sponsor. That's a very uh, significant distinction. How about that impact, Larry? Yeah, so, so it's interesting, right? Because we saw the hands that got raised for mentorship or being a mentee, right? It's, it's all the rage now. But that, that term of sponsor is different. It's more impactful. It actually is a driver for you, right? It's, and, and I like to use this analogy, so to all my sports fans, right, if you know basketball, you know what a layup is, right? You go to the basket and you sort of gently place the ball in a position where it's going to go up and eventually go through the basket. It's great. That's a mentor. You're preparing the ball to be scored and go through the hoop. Now, a dunk is different. A dunk is you are going up and forcibly throwing the ball through the hoop. You are directly impacting the ball's path in a forceful and a direct way. That's a sponsor. A sponsor is someone who's going to help drive the train and not just teach you how to get on board. So we all have to A, find sponsors, but many of us in leadership have to recognize the difference and become sponsors. We talk about mentorship all too often, and this term of sponsorship is left in the wind. We have to start becoming sponsors more than just mentors. Fantastic. We're going to have to, when we do this again for another audience, we're going to have to change the, uh, the analogy because when I look in the crowd, I don't think most of us could dunk. <laughs> 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 but you're absolutely right. That is, and the question, the challenge is, who are you and to whom? And that's kind of what we're driving here. So when we're creating these opportunities, we create it within the organization. We all know that in our discipline of cybersecurity, you have lots of specializations where you are the expert in this little sliver. I was mentoring, not sponsoring, a young lady who is about to graduate, and she has no idea what she wants to do in this discipline. And I asked, did your instructors, did your counselors, did they help you? And they didn't do a very good job. I said, okay, so what we have to do, and I started to de define jobs that had multiple skills. So if you want to be in security and you want to learn a lot about different tools and technologies and processes and skills, a SOC. A SOC has it all in one spot. IT, a NOC. A NOC has all that in one spot. If you pick just one of those things and you're working remotely, you might not get that experience across the organization. So cross-training is a big deal. It is. It is. I, lessons learned here. Uh, we did big splashes in the beginning and we tried a few things that didn't work. Some of them did work. But what we found was a, a strategic initiative that's focused on a specific set of the population with programming and activity designed to not only acquire that, that talent but also to build that talent in very specific ways requires intentionality. So with a rotation kind of opportunity. The talent can be exposed to different things across the, co the company, but it also does it in a way that's safe. They can make mistakes, they can see, they can observe. In addition to that, we added an education component to our initiative so that they could build the skills, so that they could practice skill building inside the cybersecurity space and walk away with a certification. The last piece of it was allowing the talent to practice. So everyone in this team who was intentionally sponsored and placed 
in a specific area of the organization spent time in the organization practicing the skills that they built and also saying, hey, I'd like to be exposed to this area of the organization or this area of problems. And that was a more effective approach for us. Cross-training, cross-skilling, and also giving them exposure. That was more specific, more targeted and focused, and we've netted better results from our, our activity. Now, and that's fantastic. And that's the idea for some of those starting they don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And their dream job that satisfies all their needs, all their wants, all their <laughs> desires may be one cubicle away. But if they're not allowed to look over the cubicle, and it's not encouraged, rewarded to do that, that uh, is an employee who has a shelf life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And they usually leave. It's a, it's, for us, it was about a year, year and a half, and they were out. And that has huge impact on yes. the organization, especially on your security team, because it takes longer to, re it's harder to replace somebody than to hire the right person. Mm -hmm. Heiss, uh, speaking of impact. Hmm. As, we, as we think about this uh, cross-training, and if we think, if you take stock of your own individual level of expertise. We all gain a level of appreciation for others when we have to sit in their shoes or be exposed to what they do. And so, especially when you're in a crisis mode, uh, sometimes we may forget that what's easy for us is hard for someone else. We may not realize that our role has a downstream impact in a negative way to our teammate. However, if before the crisis happens, we're, we have been cross-trained, understand different parts of the organization, if we use a, a SOC as an example, each of the different components, when the crisis occurs, instead of being frustrated, upset, angry at someone's ineffectiveness, we're going to reach out and lend a hand. We're going to go over and say, how can I help? I know I can support you. And which creates a more collaborative team, a more effective team, and a more agile team. And when you, when, again, in crisis, that's when we see how we operate, how we are. We're, we're a little bit uh, more empathetic and provide a lot more grace when effective training occurs. And again, that's a huge investment by the organization to take time before things occur to create and gel the team and figure out where to put people. But if uh, you, may not, you may not have the opportunity to realize someone's awesomeness because you put them in a box based on a job description. Uh, and and that's, that's fantastic, especially here's one of the risks you have with the organization with that very narrow scope of a job is you create superheroes. How many of you have superheroes in your organization? They're the go-to person. They're the only person who can solve that problem. And how many of you are that superhero? <laughs> okay. When we manage risk, we manage it around that superhero. So in my organizations, we say we don't like superheroes. We like superhumans. We like super people. We don't like superheroes because all of us here have exposure to the military. And one thing we all learn is every single one of us is expendable at any given point, and someone else has to take our, over that responsibility. And as a person in that role, I have to make sure that my replacement is going to be able to step up and accomplish the mission task. It's different in business because superheroes have job security. But that's a risk that you're accepting in your organization when you do that. So having that cross-training, having that redundancy, having that backup creates resilience in your organization. Uh, so with that, this is the hard one. This is one of the hardest topics that we see is how do you measure, how do you have accountability, social accountability in your field? How do you know when you made it? How do you know when you're doing it right? How do you measure it? Larry, I'm gonna give this one to you. Yeah, Mr. Course, Slam Dunk. Of course, <laughs> <laughs> of course you are. Um, this is the hard one, right? This is the one where organizations continue to fail, right? Um, many of us have seen the numbers game, right? Oh, we, we, we hit our target, 
we want it to be this percentage of diverse. We got it. Uh, we got the one black guy, black girl in the room. We got the one woman in the room, right? We're, woo, we did it, right? Um, it's tough. It's tough. You also have the other internal components. Okay, you, you hit this supposed target, but now you have these other inequities. Well, these diverse candidates you, that you brought in, right, aren't, their voices aren't heard, or maybe they're not getting the raises and they aren't on the same salary plane as their peers, right? We heard the term, closed mouth don't get fed. Um, so did anybody know that diverse people don't typically ask for raises? How many people in here have asked verbally for a raise? That's, I love seeing that. That's, that's uncommon. Most of the time, people don't even realize. And, and being having been a global CISO for a long time in a lot of different organizations, I can tell you, statistically, it's not the people that raise their hand that are coming asking for a raise, asking to receive what they deserve based on the output that they've been doing. It's not. And because it's not asked, it's not thought about. So from a social standpoint, from a social accountability standpoint, we all have these biases that we sometimes don't even realize, right? We've got these built-in biases into us. Now, because I'm a black man, there are a lot of things that I pay probably a lot more attention to than my white male colleagues, right? But when we go into organizations, this aspect of understanding the social accountability that I must have and that the organization must hold, I've got to hold them accountable to doing some things beyond just meeting some numbers. And so everybody in this room, when you're going back to your organizations, you need to look at your organization and ask them not only what are they doing, but what are the things that they are doing to measure it and how do they define success? It's going to be different for every other organization, right? But that success needs to be tied to business initiatives and business outcomes. Because if it's not, then they're not measuring for success, they're measuring for statistics. So having that conversation, and as the diverse people that are likely the ones asking that question, it's going to be a hard conversation, but you need to be prepared to have it. And just like it's hard to have these conversations in a room, it's going to be hard. But if you don't ask it, closed mouths don't get fed. So your organization is never going to do anything to achieve if they aren't put on notice that someone is watching and paying attention to them doing that. You know, that, that's, a, that's a great point, and uh, that has a big impact on the organization, especially when you make it transparent to everybody. These are the demographics of who's getting raises, who's not getting raises, and if it's tied to performance, you could argue you got a bigger raise because you're performing better. So, Nicole, what's the impact on, on the organization? So again, I feel like I'm the lessons learned person. So because we've been in the, in the journey in this work for a number of years now, and I believe it's about expectation setting as well in terms of set, setting those metrics. If you're a leader and you know that the bottom line metric that you need is a target that's, that's attached to a strategic imperative, you're trying to build the, the team to move to that strategic imperative or to that business outcome, there might be a short-term gain that you need to make transparent. There might be a longer-term gain that you need to develop the appetite and the muscle to sustain the activity long enough to actually see. And for us, it's often the longer term gains that are the hardest because it requires sustained attention, it requires focus, it requires more reps than the next bonus or the next opportunity for promotion, but that's where the big gains are. That is really where the big gains are. And if you're in leadership, and you can set long-term and short-term targets, it sets expectations appropriately. And one thing, we had to look at this, there's, there's cultural issues here. So, I went, like I said, we, we fielded a lot of questions with a lot of uh, senior executives, and one of them was a CEO of a $100 million plus company. And I said, who gets raises? And he told me, very transparently. 
the men get raises over the women. Why? And like Larry said, you know, they, they ask for it. From a business perspective, I'm trying, this is him, I'm quoting him, I'm trying to keep my costs as low as possible. And if you'll work for a dollar plus and you'll work for a dollar minus, to me it's an average of a dollar. But it's the women who are all on the minus because they don't ask for it. And it's a lot of the men majority are on the plus. He said, if they ask for it, I'd give them the raise. But why am I just going to give them the raise if they're not asking for it, if I can keep them? HR team there is designed to get you in at the lowest possible price point, to get the right talent at the lowest possible price point. But if you look across the organization and you see a pattern, that's where you can start to say from an executive position, we're reinforcing a pattern here that we, we shouldn't be. Now, if a certain demographic is outperforming, you say, okay, I can justify that. But now you've got to ask a question on why are they outperforming? Is this group getting the training opportunities? Is this, troop, this uh, particular group getting the voice? Are they getting the better chance to succeed as opposed to this other group? Now, we talked about this in preparation, I thought, and you're the talent person, so I'm going to go back to you on that one. How do you address something like that? Yeah, absolutely. You, you address it head on. Again, this is the hard stuff that we are responsible to do. We are responsible for going into those conversations, looking at the information, and asking layered questions about why this phenomenon exists. If we see that there is disparity, and we know that it's compared to performance evaluations that have bias in them, it's our responsibility to level the playing field around performance evaluation. Those are things that we can impact as leaders in the talent space, in the people space. Leaders of the organization have to set the right standards and have to set those standards connected to the values of the organization. And those are values we believe apply to all. So the impact is that each person in the organization has to feel valued. They have to be um, compensated for the value that they bring to the organization. And if we're leaders in the organization, it's incumbent upon us to set the right conditions for everyone to contribute, and then to hold the, the organization accountable for valuing every single person who's at the table. You know, an interesting byproduct of that, one of the organizations that I led is I created a program that training was required, training was expected, and you became the go-to part of the organization where people wanted to join your team. And so I got to be more selective on who my team members were. And it goes back to all those other things we're talking about, but the idea is that if your social accountability is transparent, it's not just an executive uh, team that's seen that, it's the rank and file that are seeing it, and they want to be on that team that they're going to get a fair shot. And they're going to be loyal to you. And they're going to extend beyond that one year you know, where someone who's dis uh, disgruntled. So you're building a strong team. We say people don't leave jobs, they leave leaders. Mm -hmm. They leave teams. So bringing them in, this team concept, and them being able to self-select into these teams is also a very important aspect. So that's our sixth point here, Heiss. And so if, we, if we're honest, all, all of us have, have arrived at different organizations because one, we applied to be in them, <laughs> okay? We, we all self-select, there's a selection bias in the organization that we're in. We self-select to be a part of certain teams, and if we're honest, um, why do we join organizations? Well, besides being compensated, we want to be in a space where we can bring our best selves to the organization. So that, that as uh, Nicole is highlighting, it puts a burden on the firm to create the space so that the individuals feel like they're going to be a, a part of a positive interaction. That's a lot of work. And it goes back to an earlier discussion around the culture. So if we think about the culture of the organization and selection to be a, a part, the, the connectedness is if an environment 
is not inclusive, it does not provide the space for individuals to be valued, which means we or individuals will self-select away. And so as, as uh, Larry highlighted, uh, African American women are the, uh, a, the highest group leaving cybersecurity because the organization hasn't created a safe space, which means in the current environment, when you're talented, you can select out because you know you have the skills and capabilities to go get another job or do it yourself because every organization is a data-based organization. Every organization needs a level of security and protection. And so those who are skilled will not be a part. And so I really think there's a great opportunity for organizations to really think about not only DE&I, but focus on the inclusion part first in order to drive the diversity necessary and then think through the equitable compensation piece that is required to maintain and retain talent. You know, and that, that's great. When you talk about those teams, it also breaks down barriers. Mm -hmm. When you choose to be on the team and you're on a team, you, those uh, physical attributes tend to, tend to disappear. And now you're focusing on a team member's skills, knowledge, ability, whether they have it or they don't, and you got to build that up because you're in it as a team. And that also impacts. So what about these self-selected teams? So, so here's the reality. As a leader, I want to lead as little as possible. Seriously, at the, at the end of the day as a CISO, I want to create a strategy, but I want my teams to function. I don't want to have to lead them. I want the teams to actually be able to manage themselves. So when you have these teams that are self-selecting teams, if you think about a wolf pack, right? When a wolf in a wolf pack gets injured or is not doing what they, the pack takes care of that wolf. They don't go to the bigger pack and the leader of the bigger pack and say, hey, we got this one. You don't, right? The pack takes care of it. So in teams, if you have self-selecting teams, what begins to happen is they begin to work better together because they begin to hold each other up in their weak moments. Oh, you're not that great at this, but she is. So when you have this moment that you're reaching that point of weakness, we're going to make sure that she comes over and helps you so you get stronger in that area. And in the areas that I'm weak as a team member, I know that he's strong in that, and I'm going to go to him when I have these weak moments. If we do that as a team, whoever our leader is, they don't have to lead us as much. That's the value of it, because it then makes, A, your team more efficient and effective. It begins to remove the, the biases that we have because we're focusing on people's skills and what they're bringing to the table to enable and support us and support each other as a team. And then it makes our leaders better because we are giving better output and having better outcomes from the work that we're doing to provide to the leadership. And one of those things with those self-selected teams, I always say, play to your strength. I'll shoot a free throw. <laughs> <laughs> the play to your strength, we all have strengths and weaknesses. In that team, you're going to cover the weakness that the team has, not necessarily just the individual. And the strength that they have, you're going to highlight that and let them carry that aspect of it. There are some people who are better at, uh, let's just say, uh, the presentation, better speakers. Others are better at building the presentation. Others are better at research. Why would I mix that up in a way that I'm not playing on the best talent, but if I, if I have weakness on that team, and this is the team I have, I'm going to have to build that capability into them. Doesn't matter what color they are. Doesn't matter what sex they are. Doesn't matter how they identify. For me, they're my team member. And so that's the important part is that to the rotation and cross-training, I have the ability to look at the teams and see which one I want to be a part of. And as a leader, an executive in an organization, I want my team, I want my team to be the go-to team. But that's a creating that environment. So that, that's, uh, you just heard us talk about strategic. You talk, we talked about the implementation. And just to recap, we talked about engagement, contact, sponsoring, cross-training rotations, social accountability, and self-organized, self-selected teams. We're coming to the end here. What we intended to do today 
is to not just inform you, but to inspire you to do better as yourself, your team, as a leader for your organization and, and those of us around us. But that's not enough. We also want to empower you. So inform, inspire, and empower. Takeaways are a key thing. So I'm going to ask my distinguished panel here, what is one key takeaway that this audience here should not miss the opportunity? Uh, I'm going to start with, with you, Larry. All right. So, so for me, this is easy. So I've been speaking at RSA and around the globe, and many of you know, for years about the need for diversity in cyber. We're past that point. We all recognize it's a need. But what's happened over that time is I also realized that there's a lot of, yes, oh, woo -hoo. who's going to fix it? Well, for the past four years, every time I get on the stage, I point to everybody in here. Each of you has a responsibility to be part of the change that you want. You can't wait for someone else to do it. You can't wait for your organization to just know that they need to do it. Each one of you, regardless of how high or how low your role is in your organization, has to be a part and go do something. Go say something to someone, go give someone some tools, some techniques, some tactics, something you took away from here, something you heard somewhere else. But each of you has a responsibility to do something and not wait for someone else to do it. You know, and, and that's interesting because I, you know, we've talked about this before and we all have multiple personas, just like we have multiple emails. How many use the junk email for sign up so you don't get all the spam? <laughs> we, it's a persona. And I say you have a persona as, as you, as a member of a team, as a leader, and a member of the community. And all of those are part of your organization. Pick one. Start there. Just pick one. Don't make it hard. Nicole. I say get in the work. Um, the work is long and the work is hard. And sometimes the work is not that gratifying, but it's necessary to get in the work. One tactical thing I would encourage everyone in here to do is if you are a leader, go and develop, touch, make touch points, build relationships with the junior member of your team. Show them the way. Help them to understand what space left and right limits they have for failure and allow them to fail and make mistakes in a safe space. If you are a junior member of the team, go out and find one other person outside of your organization and attract them to the space. We need 3.4 million people. We can't find those 3.4 million people looking in the same spaces we've always looked in. And we're not going to close the gap if we don't go out and reach and pull through. So if you're, jun if you're a leader, go and find someone who's junior to develop, build a relationship. If you're junior, go and pull someone into the space. Heist, with one minute left. <laughs> Well, so, so to build on that, I, would, uh, I challenge all of, all of you to think about who is in your network, who is part of your team, what are the uh, demographics of said team, I'm sure they're amazing, and then find someone who's completely different than that group that's around you all the time. Remember I said earlier, we're a herd mentality, we're going to find people who are like ourselves. The point here is, reach out to someone different. That's the contact part. Engage someone who is a little bit different from you, either by knowledge, skills, and attributes, or just purely demographic. That's going to be a challenge for you. That's going to make you feel very uncomfortable. But being a leader is a contact sport. And there are many moments where discomfort is just a part of the, the title. And at some level, all of us are leaders, either informally or formally. All of us are mentors to someone, mentees to someone else, and at some point may have the opportunity to sponsor others. So I really challenge you to take stock of your network and then find someone, some individual who is vastly different from you and reach out to them. My takeaway is remember when you're climbing up that ladder of success, remember to reach down also and pull someone up, reach across, 
because somebody, you may not know it, is helping you along on that climb. So we're in it together, and we're going to succeed together. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a question.